Yeah. Vous êtes français Oui. Ah, ok, enchanté. Bonjour. Je suis ici depuis 25 ans. Ah oui J'étais ici avant l'indépendance pour des rénovations d'usines textiles. Et au fur et à mesure, on a, on a fait des affaires, on a développé, et aujourd'hui, on est presque 4000 personnes. Ah oui Et vous faites uniquement du marché local ou... Non, justement, on fait que de l'export. Que de l'export Que de l'export. A Belgian employer at the head of an Uzbek textile factory of 4,000 employees that only does exports. We would like to know more, but because we're being carefully watched, we suggest that we meet again later. Two months after our return from Uzbekistan, we have a meeting with the Belgian employer in a Parisian cafe. Before he arrives, we install a number of hidden cameras. Don't forget that we're pretending to be French buyers interested in the products he makes in Uzbekistan. Voilà, the oh. Merci beaucoup, c'est gentil. Before the Made in Uzbekistan polo shirt and our questions about the reputation of Uzbek cotton, the businessman proposes a scheme. Aujourd'hui, il n'est pas obligatoire de marquer l'origine de produit. D'accord. Si vous voulez qu'on marque Made in Bulgarie, on va vous mettre Made in Bulgarie. Si vous voulez qu'on mette, vous mettre Made in Allemagne, on va vous mettre Made in, made in Allemagne. Si, si moi je vous commande des vêtements et que je veux mettre... Euh, C'est ça que vous me dites Oui, on ne peut pas mettre Made in France, hein, puisqu'ils viennent de l'étranger, donc là, évidemment, ce n'est pas possible. Mais on peut vous mettre Made in Portugal. Et ça, vous l'avez déjà fait enfin, Oui, ouais. Made in Spain. Oui, oui, bien sûr. Oui. Mais qui vous le demande, par exemple enfin, Les clients. Les clients, oui. Les clients oui. Pour ne pas avoir Made in Uzbekistan. Made in Uzbekistan, oui, oui, bien sûr. Oui. Et ça, c'est pas... Made in Italy, c'est très, très bon. Made in Italy, donc vous pouvez faire du Made in Italy Ah oui, oui. Oui, ça, ça marche très bien, ça. We checked. Marking a product with its origin is optional, it's true. Marking with the wrong origin, on the other hand, is illegal, of course. Dès que le coton est tricoté, on perd la trace du, du coton. Et ce coton-là, par exemple, à partir du moment où il a été tricoté, on ne peut plus savoir où il est passé. Ce fil-là, il a passé donc euh, au moins cinq ou six frontières. Et à partir de là, c'est perdu. Verifying our interlocutor's information is not easy. We admit things are a bit hazy. Thankfully, three months after our trip, we receive a list of people and businesses present at the Uzbek Cotton Fair, the one we were invited to. This document allows us to identify some of the foreign buyers. We find big traders of raw materials, but also dozens of spinning mills with factories in China, Turkey, and especially in Bangladesh. Many show the names of their clients on their website. They say that they supply to well-known brands such as Auchan, Camayeu, Benetton, Celio, or Monopri. Surprisingly, some of the factories that attended the fair in Uzbekistan say they supply to brands participating in the Uzbek cotton boycott, like Zara, Carrefour, H&M and C&A. In an attempt to verify this information, we contact these factories as journalists. Since no one responds, we continue our investigation by posing as buyers. The cotton trail takes us from Uzbekistan to Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world and the biggest producer of clothes after China. All along the road there are textile factories and spinning mills where imported cotton is being delivered. 
With our fake brochures and our fake business cards, we begin with the most important spinning mill on our list, Riedische, one of the biggest groups in the country. On its website, the company shows its client base to include textile industry giants and well-known brands. In this public document, H&M, one of the rare groups to publish its list of suppliers, cites Riedische as one of its subcontractors. When it comes to the cotton's origin, the factory always mentions Australia and the USA on its website. There's nothing about Uzbekistan. Despite several visit requests as foreign clients, the bosses never replied. Arriving in front of the factory, with all these men in uniform and this formidable stronghold, we realize it's not going to be easy. But we give it a go. Hello. Do you think it's possible to visit? The factory owner isn't here. His right-hand man lets us in. Hello. Yeah. Dis-lui qu'on a envoyé un mail pour savoir si on pouvait visiter. On n'a jamais eu de réponse. Please sit down. Yeah. Thanks to our lovely brochures, the man is nonetheless going to drop his boss a line. So not possible. Even five minutes, ten minutes. Sorry. Okay. It's a pity. It's a pity. Thank you. <laughs> With the number of uniformed men surrounding us, we don't insist. A last military salute for the road, and we get in the car. Despite failing to get us into the factory, our cover actually ends up working. Thanks to our business cards, after a few days we secure a crucial meeting to help us follow the Uzbek cotton trail. It's a meeting with one of the most important cotton sellers in the country. We go along with our translator. The company is called Baku Group. In Bangladesh, it encompasses some of the biggest traders in the world. The American Cargill with its $120 billion sales revenue. The Singaporean Olam with $20 billion. And the Swiss Ecom with its modest $4 billion. To begin with, we asked the manager where the cotton he imports to Bangladesh comes from. I would say Uzbek. First for you? First for me would be still Uzbek, yes. Okay. Roughly 60% okay. of what I sell is Uzbek. Okay. Cotton picked uh, by hand is usually cheaper. Okay. Why? For, for, it's it's uh, labor, usually these countries labor is pretty cheap, right? So it's cheaper to, be, to use labor in those countries than machines? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Like that. Sorry. Hey, Carl. Hello. Hi, mate. How you doing? Hi. What's happening? Tonight, close 600 tons, but if you see my, uh, my message, if, if it goes below 76, give me a buzz. You might just do the do 1,200 tons instead of 6. Okay? Great. Sorry. So you're dealing with hundreds of tons? <laughs> yes, That's I it? Am. I am. Uh, okay. I'm dealing with a lot of foreigners and my customer base in Bangladesh is also very limited. There are over 200 spinning mills in Bangladesh, but I deal with hardly 30 One. big ones, good ones, who are financially strong. I deal with only them. Okay. Which, which are, for example? Uh, which I'll give you a few examples. One can be uh, Prime Textiles, uh, it's a pretty good company, uh, Kea, mm, who else? Uh, Ridisha. Redisha, just the company we're interested in. The formidable stronghold, the factory that only mentions Australian and American cotton on its website. And the factory whose clients like Carrefour, Zara and H&M practically all claim to be boycotting Uzbek cotton. 
Yet according to the trader, the factory buys almost 50% of the cotton from Uzbekistan. The trader knows the manager at Redisha well, so before we leave, we ask if he might be able to convince him to meet us. While we wait, we make the most of our buyer status to find out what the spinning mills look like. In the first factory, the Delta factory that we'll call factory number one, the manager is happy to receive us and we're given a tour by the owner. The opening scene is almost poetic, with an avalanche of cotton being scooped up by workers in coloured clothes. You might even think it was a nice job to be a cotton blender, but that's before we arrive in this corridor and this room where we see these workers. Teenagers sitting in front of a machine used to make synthetic threads. It could cut off their fingers in a momentary lapse of concentration. In Bangladesh, miners are not allowed to do dangerous work. But the manager reassures us. After that, we leave the 19th century to see the production lines that are completely mechanized and function 24 hours a day. To operate these machines, the teams work 3-8, that is, day and night. Here, too, are the faces of teenagers. Officially, night shifts are off limits for under 18s, the manager assures us, of course, that his factory is above board and that he respects the legislation. Finally, he takes us to see his warehouses, where the cotton he imports from abroad is stored. And you have Uzbek as well? Yes, Turkmen, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan. So three things are there, but uh, you are saying, you are trying to see Uzbek. Huh? This is Uzbek John. This is Uzbek as well. Yeah. It's whilst in this factory that we learn that Uzbek cotton lacks something the rest of the cotton has. Normally they don't have any sticker for Uzbek like this. They don't have stickers? No, no. no? But US cotton they have. Any countries, they are writing there, this is uh, Burkina Faso, this is Mali, like this. And uh, even uh, Australia, US, we are getting uh, cotton with mark. But for Uzbek zone, there is no mark. No indication of the country of origin, to avoid traceability, presumably. 